Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MRF Meet the Honoree for our 19th annual New York City Virtual Gala, which we are calling an at-home celebration. We are so sad that we're not gonna be celebrating in person, but we're really excited to be honoring some fantastic and most deserving honorees this year. And to kick off our gala season, we are here today with Neeroshana, Ananda Sabapathy. And we are so happy to hear from her and celebrate a little bit of her achievement before we celebrate it in December. So for those of you who do not know, we will be kicking off on December the 2nd, virtually to celebrate our New York City Gala. And even though it's an at-home celebration, we're gonna mix it up a little bit this year and do things differently to bring a little excitement to the event. We are doing something called Unlock the Cure. For a mere hundred dollars, you have a chance to win amazing prizes. In fact, we have 30 items that we're going to be auctioning off over the course of the next month or two. And they range from a trip to Mexico, which you can book through 2022, to a guitar signed by Coldplay. We'll have a thousand chances. So again, for hundred dollars, you can really win an amazing prize. So we hope that you'll participate in that. Um, we would also like to thank our generous sponsors. We have received really amazing support from Neutrogena, Genentech, Castle Biosciences, Merck, Novartis, Onkasek, and the Tavoso family. So we would just like to thank them for their generous support. We know that this year has been very challenging and we're grateful for the investment that they're making in the Melanoma Research Foundation. So I would like to start by introducing this year's humanitarian honoree, Dr. Ananda Sapathi, and give a little bio on her before I let her take over and share some more interesting facts about herself. But Dr. Ananda Sapathi is a female physician scientist studying how the immune system sees and fails to see cancer and infectious pathogens. She's at Whale Cornell, where she practices dermatology and focuses on the early detection of melanoma in her patients. Her research program is again, centered on melanoma immunity. She initially became fascinated with the role of the immune system in detecting and eradicating cancer since she was a PhD student, student studying T cells intolerance in 1998. Not only is she seeing patients, but she's also in the laboratory where her efforts span human and mouse immunology, directly examining patient samples and cohorts to improve cancer immunotherapy and also understanding why melanoma non-responders fail to respond to treatment. Her lab asks very basic questions like, why is the smallpox vaccine so effective? in order to try to discover new potential pathways for cancer immunotherapy intervention. Dr. Ananda Sapathi is trained in vaccine science, immunology, and clinical investigation with the rate Ralph Steinman, who discovered the main cell type, the dendrinic cell. So fascinating. And that's the cell that teaches the immune system to either mount a long-lived protective immune response or remain intolerant and not destroy its own tissue. She was in his lab where he won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Medicine, and she has run an independent program herself since 2013. Her independent work has been published in high impact journals, including Cell. She is a native New Yorker, which we'll hear about in a little bit. And she completed her undergraduate MD PhD training at Stanford University and recently located back to New York City where she, again, began her, her career at Whale Cornell Medicine, where she has leadership roles in dermatology, immuno-oncology, human immunology at the Mayor Cancer Center. Do you think she's a little accomplished? <laughs> she also spends time teaching residents, fellows, postdoctoral trainees, and undergraduate students. So with that very long list of accomplishments, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Neeroshana Andasapathy. Thanks so much, Kylie, for that very nice, warm, generous introduction. I think the most important um, 
biographical detail is that I have a six and a seven year old. So let's hope they don't zoom bomb us on this live Facebook, <laughs> but it's fun. It's been a busy time during the pandemic, but really nice to see the kids at all stages of their day. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the zoom bombs are always a possibility with these, <laughs> with these live broadcasts. Um, but let's let's start off a little bit. I mean, you are extremely accomplished. And as I just read, you know, you have been involved in many different facets of medicine. But I think everyone always is curious to know what made you want to go into the medical field to start off with? Thank you for that question, Kylie. So um, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be here with me, MRF. Um, so you know, I grew up in New York and I was the child of immigrants. My father is a physician. My sister is a physician. I definitely came from one of those families where the values of being a doctor um, were very much present. And so I, I thought to myself, okay, I want to be a concert pianist and a doctor. I want to be an astronaut and a doctor. I want to be a marine biologist and a doctor. Um, I want to be a scientist and a doctor. And I studied the arts a lot. My mom is a painter. So I actually ended up double majoring in biological sciences and art history when I was at Stanford. And I worked at the Met. And my very hardworking Asian parents said, absolutely not. <laughs> you cannot go into becoming a painter. So, um, and, but I think that, I think that dermatology, th those skills, those visual skills from art really can be applied both in the laboratory and in, um, which is a very creative practice and also in my clinical practice. So I think you don't always know why you're doing what you're doing, but I think everything kind of comes together in the end. That's great. And dermatology is, like you said, it is a vis visual art in many ways. So you could definitely apply a lot of that as well. Um, you have a very interesting career because you're not only treating patients in clinic, but you're also doing research. Can you talk a little bit about that, that dynamic? It's busy. Um, so I see patients a half day a week, sometimes a full day a week. Um, and my patient mixes, you know, a, like at least half my population's melanoma. In the past, it's been fully melanoma. And then I also do a lot of general dermatology because I think screening for melanoma is so important in our community. Um, and then I do some inpatient consultations and I try to do New York screenings for melanoma in the general population as a service because that's so important and education is so important. Um, things get busy. I mean, I think um, it's a very dynamic career. Every day is a little bit different. It's a mix of teaching and students, which I love, clinical translation and human immunology, which I love, um, thinking about you know, obstacles in science and new cures, but also just thinking about getting patients a prescription they might need or calling back somebody with their vitamin D level. So it's, it's a nice mix of things that doesn't get boring. But you know, there are times, I think, again, in your career, you feel like, would things have been different if I was all clinical or all research? And then at some point you always feel behind and then suddenly you're just doing it. You know, you're just, it's like driving a car. You're like, wait a sec, like I'm on the road. Like you just have to do it and you do it. That's great. And I'm sure a lot of what you're learning in the clinic, then you can apply to the lab as well. There's a nice relationship there. Boss talk is so key. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I mean, I think we see things in the clinic that we don't understand. Like we don't understand, for example, why sometimes melanoma metastases, which aren't sensitive, can be made sensitive to make the immune system respond. And it helps us think like how, what could be useful for stimulating immune response, whether it's a virus or whether it's freezing or whether it's a way of getting those dendritic cells to flip from tolerizing to immunizing. Um, we also see interesting phenomenon when we're doing screenings. Like we see these nevi, like moles, that there's like a little halo around them. They're called halo nevi and there's T cells right around those moles. And so as dermatologists, we've known for a long time that T cells do see moles and they see funny moles because we see T cells going into them. So there's a lot of crosstalk between both of those. And that's what makes things extremely exciting, but it, it is busy. It sounds very busy, but like you said, very exciting and very hopeful for patients, I'm sure who are, you know, are able to see that translation happen from the bench to the bedside. So um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about immunity, right? We, a lot of patients know about immunotherapy and the current immunotherapies that are offered. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, again, melanoma immunity, what you're looking at in your research lab and what you see as um, a potential breakthrough specifically in melanoma? That's a wonderful question. I, I, I guess I think of it as, 
one of the therapeutic steps that we think about with immunotherapy is how do we save our patients' lives? Like that's the front line, right? Because that's the most important thing. But extending that further, we want to make sure that we don't just save somebody's life now, but that their immune system remembers the difference between cancer and normal melanocytes for their lifetime. And so some of the questions that have come up, for example, with the coronavirus or with the smallpox vaccine are just as relevant to melanoma vaccines and immunology, which is how do we make long lived protective immunity that's present in all our sites. So not only where your immune system kills and destroys the primary tumor, but in all your tissues where distant metastases might get away. So your immune cells can reject those when they land. Um, and one of the things that you've probably read about in the news is how we measure immunity for coronavirus. Do we measure antibodies? Or um, for, for cancer, we often measure or try to measure T cell responses. Um, but my patients teach me so much. Uh, you know, for example, I have a patient who's, you know, stopped their checkpoint therapy many, many years ago, and they have the autoimmune disease vitiligo. And their vitiligo continues to occur, but likely that process of their T cells destroying their healthy melanocytes may very well be protecting them to recurrent melanoma. And so we're always learning from our patients and the stories they tell us about what they observe and what's happening for them. It's a good point because many of the breakthroughs that have happened in melanoma really have been in the last 10 years. So do you feel like we're continuing to discover? Do you feel like that discovery has kind of plateaued? Where, where do you see kind of the next big leap in discovery? I absolutely think that we've just kicked the door open on this. Um, melanoma has always been kind of the hallmark disease that's opened up avenues of therapy to many other diseases, whether it was signaling therapy or whether it's immunotherapy or combination therapy. Um, and in that, it's so important to support melanoma because every point of support will translate to other cancers, kidney cancer, lung cancer. Um, I mean, you know, checkpoint approval or checkpoint inhibitor approval has now brought into so many indications. And without support of organizations like the MRF and other melanoma organizations, that wouldn't have been possible because those were high risk approaches, which ended up working. So I think we've just, you know, we're kind of, I still think we have hit on something extremely effective and important. But what about the 30 to 40% of patients who are not responsive? Or what about patients who have responded and have now lapsed? Or what about actually being able to say, look, this family has one of the, is one of the rare ones where melanoma runs in the family and it may be linked to pancreatic cancer, it may be linked to other sorts of mutations. So how can we protect individuals in those families? Can we get ahead of the cancer? Can we create lifelong immunity? Um, or can we, beyond therapeutically acutely curing that, how can we maintain long-term protective immunity? And those are some of the really important questions that remain unsolved. Why are patients resistant? How do we overcome resistance mechanisms? And how can we use other drugs to get T-cells that may be stubborn um, to switch over, to get dendritic cells that may not be quite as licensed or danger-sensing as we want them to be, to actually say, look, things are bad. I need to do something to get the T cells stimulated to make them form a long lived memory. And that's where studying things like the smallpox vaccine, which is our most effective vaccine in human history, um, can really help us. So it's interesting because you, you, you brought, up, brought up the pandemic and there's a lot of research right now going into the COVID-19 vaccine. Tons and tons of resources. And obviously, we're used to seeing you in a white coat at Cornell, seeing patients not sitting on your couch in your living room, looking out, you know, your, your window, seeing the New York skyline back there. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how the potential vaccine work that's being done, maybe with the COVID-19 vaccine, could also maybe benefit melanoma patients down the line? I think that current clinical trial strategies. And I would actually flip the question, Kylie, to say that work that was done in melanoma vaccines may also help to benefit our rational thinking about infectious vaccines. So one of the things we know is that a type of T cell called a Th1 cell is what protects you predominantly to viral responses and tumor responses. 
And we know a certain kind of dendritic cell conveniently called a dendritic cell one derives those T cells to protection um, in both the viral context and in the melanoma context. So surprisingly, those processes can be very similar. And what you need to drive one forward can help to assist with the other. Now with the current COVID vaccine, coronaviruses are typically not that immunogenic, meaning that people don't usually develop long-lived protective immunity to coronaviruses. But we know that people do develop long-lived protective immunity to herpes virus or to vaccine or the smallpox vaccine virus. Um, and so in, in that setting, um, you know, I, I think a lot of vaccine research being done for influenza, for coronavirus, has a lot of crosstalk with cancer vaccine research as well, and vice versa. Um, cases where we've tried to get dendritic cells to work against melanoma and have failed would help us know, okay, that probably isn't gonna be the right approach for stimulating a coronavirus response. But in situations where we can target dendritic cells and make them sense danger, those types of approaches can be extremely efficacious for getting strong immune responses to coronavirus as well. So have you seen a lot of melanoma labs kind of pivot to COVID-19 labs over the last few months? Um, I personally haven't because I think the thing with cancer is it's not gonna go away. And through this whole pandemic, um, you know, I covered the COVID hotline and I've been seeing patients in my clinic steadily since May, um, as I think many physicians have. And, you know, it's, the whole world has stopped, but for cancer patients, their world has already stopped. So we can't stop. Um, so I think in that setting, I think both are equally urgent and we're on the clock for, for all things. And that's important um, to remember. We have seen a lot of other immunology labs pivot. We've seen certainly um, experts in cancer immunology lend their expertise to reviewing coronavirus grants and to developing new strategies. And um, I'm seeing really incredible coronavirus um, grants coming out of cancer centers where there are many great immunologists based. Um, but I don't think any of us will primarily ever really stop our work in cancer. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly the framing of how we think about these things may have changed a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, that's certainly a message that we've been echoing at the MRF. We actually have the hashtag cancer has no curve because cancer doesn't stop for people, right? You know, we can flatten the curve, we can come up with a vaccine, but for a melanoma patient who's battling every single day, you know, all this research can't stop, all this progress can't stop. So thank you for, for continuing to march on despite all of this. Um, I wanna ask you, you've been a huge supporter of women in science, and we have many people watching today who are you know, doing their medical training and, and really looking to mentors like you who've really led the way. What advice would you give somebody today, especially a young woman who's stepping into the science field? What advice would you have for her? Yeah, I think the advice I would have, um, and you know, it's an interesting political time too. It would be similar advice to what I would have for diversity issues as well, and being a minority female, um, you know, physician in science. Um, it would be the same, which is that you will encounter adversity. But the minute you allow that to hurt you, you let someone else's problem become your problem. You are not the problem. So don't allow someone to ever convince you that you are. So speak up, um, try to develop confidence in yourself and your ideas, follow your instincts, find great national mentors who will cheer you on and support you, find great collaborative peers to work with. And, um, and I think there is a level to which I think it will serve you to put on a blinder. To, it's not that you won't face adversity. It's not that you're not gonna speak up in the face of adversity because, because you are, but that it may take a little while to develop the confidence to do that. But in the beginning, it hurts, it stings. Um, it makes you doubt yourself. It makes you question, should I have reacted that way? Should I have spoken up? Should I have not spoken up? Any response you have is fine. Anything you feel is fine. The most important thing is never to let someone else's negativity undermine your confidence. That is absolutely wonderful advice. I think it's just applicable to everyone, right? Never, never let any of that influence you and, and how you see yourself. Uh, so 
last question for you. You are getting the humanitarian award. You were nominated by the New York City Gala Host Committee, which is comprised of survivors and advocates and physicians in the New York area that are very connected to the Melanoma Research Foundation and have supported this event for many years. Tell us a little bit about what this award means to you. Well, well, I'm very honored to receive this award by the MRF. Um, and and in, in so many ways, I, you know, I feel like there's so much more we could be doing. Um, but so it's hard to believe at any point in your stage of career that you receive any award because you always feel like, oh, but I have to do all this, all the, all the rest that I have to do. But um, it does mean a lot to me. And it, it means a lot also to members of my research team who have been supported um, by melanoma survivors and their families, by the patients in my clinic and other patients who, um, for them, you know, cheer this, these efforts on as well. Um, and it, it does mean a lot. I think it, it means a lot to us collectively as a community to recognize that we still have a lot of work to be done to, um, to honor the time spent doing it and the thought spent doing it to the, not only myself, but the members of my lab who are up late at night or are doing experiments around the clock and to the members of all of our clinical staff who are there to be there for all our patients. So I, I do create, consider it a great honor and I, I, you know, take a lot of pride in representing a larger team and a larger group at Cornell. Um, that's really doing the best we can to try to counter this terrible disease. And it's an honor um, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you. We are very excited to honor you on December the 3rd. And we hope everybody who's listening today feels as inspired as we do and really understands that again, cancer has no curve. We have to push on. We have to keep advocating for research and supporting research. So we hope you will all be joining us. You can visit melanoma.org slash New York Gala. And again, that website is melanoma.org slash New York Gala on December the 3rd buy your tickets, buy a chance to unlock the cure and join us and celebrate the wonderful achievements of Dr. Ananda Sabapathy with the Humanitarian Award. And again, we look forward to seeing you then. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.